In the last few videos I showed you a lot of potentially boring oscilloscope screenshots as I was investigating the characteristics and behavior of some IBT2 boards. Today I am happy to present the fruits of the efforts. A 5 amp power shield for Arduino and DCCX. Welcome to the IOTT channel, I am Hans Tanner. Here are my requirements for the IBT2 power shield. It should be in Arduino format, so it can be integrated in the DCCX Arduino stack. The board should provide 5 amps of drag current continuously. Each channel should have its own DC supply connection so that it is possible to use several independent power supplies. The user should be able to select any available Arduino I.O. pin to drive the board. The board needs to support power and brake pins like the standard Arduino motor shield. The board should support service mode programming and it also should support the upcoming DC district of DCCX. And the board should be capable to support Railcom cutouts. That's what I started with and had the first prototype boards made. After testing them I added two more requirements to the list. The board should have a connector for external standard IBT2 boards and it also should have an onboard LED to indicate the track status. Here is the first prototype PCB and it is very close to the final board except for the newly added requirements. To install it, you first configure the I.O. pins you want to use by soldering some simple wire bridges. I am going to show a little later in the video how this works in detail. But basically, you can use any Arduino I.O. pin that is available to drive this power shield. In DCCX, you specify it as usual as motor driver and set the I.O. pins that you want to use for the board. Then you simply install the board on top of the Arduino. Each board provides one track output with 5 amps output current. The standard setup is using two boards, one for main and one for the programming track. With the upcoming new version of DCCX, you can also have additional boards for running DC districts. And if you prefer to use your standard Arduino power shield for your programming track, that is possible as well. Furthermore, the final version of the board is going to have an 8-pin connector so that you can connect standard IBT2 devices using a ribbon cable. On the right side of the board you connect a DC power supply for the track voltage you want to use on your layout and the DCC track wires. And that's it. You are ready to power up your Arduino, power the IBT2 side of the board and you are ready to run your trains and I can show you some more details about the IBT2 power shield board and how it works. Of course the requirement of making the board fit the DCCX Arduino stack determines important characteristics, mainly the type and location of the pin headers which are the interface to the Arduino controller. Furthermore, to maintain the idea of stackable boards, the choice of board dimensions is limited. It does not make much sense to design a board that is much bigger than the Arduino controller sitting at the base of the stack. So I decided to make the board the exact same size as the Arduino so that it is easily possible to stack at least two of them for main and proc track and possibly more to support DC districts. As testing shows, however, the problem with that approach is the same as with the original Arduino motor shield. It is almost impossible to connect wires while everything is assembled. So I am looking into using a PCB edge connector so that power and track can simply be connected to the board after assembling the stack. To make that possible, the edge connector part of the PCB has to stick out to the side a few millimeters and I am currently working on prototype boards with that new feature. So stay tuned, subscribe to the IOTT channel and hit the bell icon and you will be among the first to know how the final solution looks like. 
After all my tests of the BTS 7960 half bridge chip in video number 105, it was sort of a given that I wanted to use this chip for my board. The performance characteristics of the chip are just outstanding. It supports DC voltages of up to 45 volts and maximum currents of up to 43 amps. So running a G-scale track with 25 volts and say 5 amps is rather at the lower end of what the chip can do. Furthermore, it has a very low on resistance of only 16 milliohms, so the power dissipation when running 5 amps will only be 200 milliwatts per chip, which makes it possible to use it without a large cooler and it therefore will fit in the space available between two boards separated by the typical Arduino headers. As with other boards, I had the option of doing everything myself or using a ready-made commercial device and just design a carrier board and the interface circuitry. Since there are only a few components required, I would normally opt for making the entire board myself, but here I ran into a problem. Finding the BTS7960 chips is not easy as they are no longer manufactured and prices are going through the roof. Ready-made boards on the other hand can be purchased on Amazon or AliExpress for a quite reasonable price of about $5 a piece. So for my board I decided to use the ready-made IBT2 device I tested in video number 105 and chose to place it on the carrier board as shown here. That way layout power and track output are on the right side while the USB connection and Arduino power jack if needed are on the left side of the resulting board stack. The next problem is how to make it configurable for all potential use cases and IO pin combinations. For that we need to have a closer look at what is required to drive an H-bridge from the Arduino and how DCCX is supporting it. A half-bridge like the BTS7960 can have three output states which are controlled by the signals IN and INHIBIT. The IN signal controls the status of the two FETs if inhibited is inactive. It makes sure that only one of the two FETs can be ON at the same time as switching on both of them simultaneously would cause a short circuit of the power supply. The inhibit signal, when low, is used to turn both transistors off. If we combine two half bridges to a full bridge, we can have four meaningful output states as shown here. Stop the video if you want to study the details. What is important to note is that in state 3, the level of the in signals does not matter they just need to be the same for both chips. To control the full bridge from the Arduino, we therefore need a minimum of three pins and there are several options to realize the functionality. One pin is needed to switch the bridge on and off, so setting the inhibit signal of at least one half bridge high or low. In the Arduino motor driver setup, this is the function of the power pin. The other two pins are used to control the direction of each half bridge individually and how this is done depends on the onboard logic of the driver board. Looking at the schematics of the popular Arduino power shield, we see that the board provides some onboard logic to generate an inverse in signal for the two half bridges. So it is possible to run the board with two IO pins but that way it is not possible to enter the break state where both half bridges are active with the same polarity. To enter this state, the board has a break signal input and if we check what it does, it eliminates the reversing of the input signal and therefore both bridges have the same polarity and the breaking takes place. The fourth parameter of the motor driver setup allows for setting this break pin while the third parameter allows for setting a second IN or PWM pin in case there is no onboard logic to generate the reverse copy of the input signal. Now, for my board I decided to support all common modes for full bridge control, so that the user can choose depending on his requirements.
and I also decided to support all IO pin modes that can be used from DCCX. Let's have a look at the simplified schematics to understand how this is achieved. On the left side we see the four possible Arduino GPIO functions that can be used. These correspond to the parameters provided in the motor driver setup described in the DCCX documentation. PWM1 and PWM2 are the two DCC pulses, sometimes also called DCCA and DCCB. If a DCC signal is sent to the track, they are always opposite to each other. If PWM1 is high, PWM2 must be low and vice versa. The board gives you the option to use one or both of the PWM pins and you configure it with the jumper. Set it to position 1-2 to use the PWM2 signal from the Arduino or set it to position 2-3 to use the inverted version of PWM1 that is generated by the NAND gate of the onboard logic. For the operation of the H-bridge it is the same, but of course you save one I.O. pin if you have the board logic generating the inverted DCC signal. The power pin is used to enable the two half-bridges. This is the power parameter in the motor driver setup. And as you notice, as long as you do not need the brake function, you can use the IVT2 board with the same settings as one half of the original Arduino motor shield. Use the power pin to switch it off and on and the PWM pin to drive the DCC output. The remaining pin is the brake input. It is implemented in positive logic, so if it goes high, the brake is activated. To achieve that, it is first inverted by running it through the first NAND gate. Then the output is used to drive both half-bridge signals high, which is creating a short circuit between the two outputs and the brake is activated. This logic allows for the following modes of operation. First, regular DCC. It is using power and one or both PWM inputs and the corresponding set of the jumper. Using only one PWM pin is kind of a motor shield compatibility mode. You can use the same motor driver setup but with a maximum trip current of about 5000 to 7000 milliamps. Second, DCC with Railcom. The board is capable to generate the Railcom cutout which requires a low resistance between the two rails of the track to enable transmission of information from the decoder to the Railcom receiver. The mode is activated if either brake is set to high or both PWM outputs are used and are set to the same level simultaneously. We will see how this function is going to be implemented in DCCX, if ever, but in any case the board is ready to support it. Third, DC district operation. Future versions of DCCX will support operating a DC track section. To do so, three Arduino pins will be required. In the standard configuration, you will use PWR to switch the board off and on. PWM1 will be used to determine the polarity of the output, hence the travel direction of the DC locomotive. And the brake pin will provide the actual PWM signal. If you follow the gate logic, you see that the output will be on with the polarity given by PWM if brake is low. If it is high, the outputs will shorten the two rails of the track. Fourth, alternative DC district operation. Alternatively to brake during the off times of the PWM signal, you can also isolate the rails. To do so, you swap power and brake. In this case, the PWM input is provided to the power pin of the board, which means the outputs are isolated if PWM is off. So, as you see, by selecting the right signals, the IBT2 board can support all typical modes of operation. Now, the question is, how can you assign a particular Arduino I.O. pin to each function? Well, that is the reason for the jumper fields on the board. There are four different fields to manage the I.O. pin assignment.
Let's start with the easy one, the jumper for the selection of the PWM signal. Place the jumper to the side where it says INT and the PWM2 signal from the onboard logic chip will be used. Place it to the PWM2 side and the board will use the X external PWM2 I.O. as specified in the motor driver setup. Right next to the jumper is the analog input selector field. Use a short piece of wire and solder it between the center bar and the analog pin you'd like to use. It is best to just solder a short wire bridge on the top side of the board with the ends of the wire reaching into the through hole. If needed, the wire can be removed quite easily and reinstalled to connect a different pin. The first large selector field lets you configure the I.O. pins for the two PWM inputs. It works the same way as the setup for the analog pins. Simply install a wire bridge from the white bar to the desired I.O. pin. The two rows of holes provide all available pins on an Arduino Uno, so from pin 2 to pin 7 in one row and pin 8 to pin 13 in the second row. Pins 0 and 1 are reserved for the serial port and can't be used to control the board. If you are only using PWM1, then PWM2 remains open. The final selector fields let you specify the connections to power and break. It works exactly the same way, simply solder a wire bridge to connect the white center bar to the I.O. pin you want to use for each function. If the function is not used, no wire bridge is installed. And if you are using an Arduino Mega and want to use one of the additional I.O.s, you can simply run a wire from the center bar to the I.O. pin you wish to connect. There is one final jumper that can be set and it is labeled V-in. If you set this jumper, you connect the DC input of the IBT2 to the V-in wire of the Arduino, which allows you to conveniently power the entire stack from one single power supply. Now, there are a few things to observe before making this connection. First, the maximum voltage. If you are running the stack without the red hat shield, you should only close this jumper if the DC power supply of the IBT2 board is 12 volts or lower. If you go higher, you risk overheating the 5 volt regulator on the Arduino board. Second, if you are using more than one IBT2 power shield boards on the same Arduino, you should only close the jumper on one board, otherwise you connect the DC power supplies for the boards together, which could result in extremely high currents in case of a short circuit. Third, always make sure that the polarity of the DC power supply is correct. As you see in the schematics, I use a FET and Zener diode to pro protect the Arduino stack against reverse polarity. This is a limited protection and works well if you connect the DC supply the wrong way and the voltage is not higher than say about 25 volts. It will not work if you connect an AC power supply, so just double check before switching on the power for the first time. Looking at the schematics of the entire board, we can recognize those elements. On page 1 we see the Arduino headers that make contact to the other boards of the stack. Then there is the selection field for the analog input. In the lower half we see the selector fields for PWM1, PWM2, power and break. And finally the jumper for the selection of PWM2. On page 2 we find the logic chip along with a smaller filter capacitor C3. That is the chip that has the NAND gates. Then there are the two sets of connector pins for the IBT2 board. One is the 1x8 pin row used by the daughter board. The other is the 2x4 pin array to connect an external IBT2 module. Next there is an additional two-pole terminal that carries the track signal. It is located on the left side of the board and can be used to either connect a DCC test track with low current consumption or to make a simple connection to the red hat shield on top of it, which uses DCC to supply the Loconet B connector. Underneath we see the V in jumper along with the FET that provides the reverse polarity protection. 
The additional four capacitors support the supply voltage of the IBT2 board and would allow to remove the onboard capacitor in case there is no room for it. But with the round hole in the carrier board it is possible to stack two or more IBT2 motor shield boards close enough to allow for safe contact of the header pins. The sub-circuit to the left is to supply the bicolor LED that indicates the track status. The track signal is first rectified and then passed through a current source to regulate the 20 mA constant current for the LEDs. Then there are two transistors that switch the LEDs on and off. With that configuration, the bipolar LED will look full bright yellow when the track carries DCC. If the board is used in DCC district mode, the LED brightness will be regulated by the PWM ratio and the color will either be green or red depending on the polarity. The final two components are related to the current sensor input. The 4.7 volt Sina diode limits the voltage of the signal and protects the analog input of the Arduino which has an absolute maximum rating of 5.5 volts. The 100 nanofarad filter capacitor filters out high frequency components of the current sense signal and makes it more stable for the Arduino to read. Watch video number 105 for more information on that topic. With the capacitor in place, the IBT2 power shield can reliably be used for service mode programming, at least as long as the decoder is DCC compliant. The ACK pulse should be 60 mA above the normal current consumption and the pulse duration should be 5 to 7 ms. Furthermore, DCC-X reads the decoders in bit mode, so this mode must be supported by the decoder, which is not always the case for older decoders. Check the decoder manual to find out if needed. One last but very important change is not in the schematics, but important to know if you plan on building the IBT2 power shield for yourself. I modified the sense resistor on the IBT2 board. Using a heat gun I removed the two 1K sense resistors and soldered a 5.1K resistor to one of the locations. Which one does not matter. There are several benefits from this modification. First, the resulting feedback voltage is 600 mV per amp, which results in 3 volts at 5 amps. That is a very convenient range to work with and leaves enough room for overcurrent. Second, this value is very close to the resulting sensor resistor of the standard IBT2 board, which has two 10K resistors in parallel, so it is possible to run both board types with the same configuration settings in the DCC-X setup. With that resistor value you can set the trip current in the DCC-X setup to 6500 or 7000 milliamps. The sense factor parameter should then be set to 8.14 to make sure that the reported values will be in milliamps. Going forward, I will finalize the second revision of the board and build a small initial series. I am also working on a modular enclosure system that will be able for download and allow you to print your own housing for the DCC-X stack. So stay tuned, there is more to come. But for today, that's it. I hope this video was useful or at least interesting for you and you are as excited as I am that 5 amp track outputs can finally be completely integrated into the DCC-X Arduino stack. If so, please let me know by commenting on this video and then click the like button below. Doing so helps to promote this video and the IOTT channel in general as it causes YouTube to suggest this video to other model railroaders. Thanks for watching and see you in the next video.